Uh, but we begin this morning with retail sales down 3% in February. Yahoo Finance's Emily McCormick joins us now with the latest. Um, on this report, Emily, which which I think everyone is fairly quick to chalk up to the weather, but um, uh, boy, a shocking headline to see this morning. That's right, Miles. Economists were expecting to see a pullback in retail sales in February, but they didn't anticipate a pullback quite this large. So to reiterate that headline figure, we saw retail sales down 3% in February over January. That was far greater than the drop of just half a percent that had been expected. Now, that was the largest drop since April 2020 at the height of those pandemic-related stay-in-place orders here in the U.S. And at the same time, though, we should note that January's retail sales were upwardly revised sharply higher to see a 7.6% month-over-month increase, up from the 5.3% rise previously reported. And that, in turn, was the biggest jump that we saw since last June. Now, February's decline really came as a result of two main factors that economists have been attributing to this decline. It's that harsh winter weather, as well as the declining effects from the last virus relief package out of Congress. So in other words, those stimulus checks from the last coronavirus package sent out in January had already been Spent likely. Now, looking by category here for February, though, do want to highlight some notable sales declines in categories that had gained in the month of January. We saw uh, department store sales down 8.4%, sporting goods and hobby store sales down 7.5%, and even those non store retailers or those e commerce stores dropped uh, their sales dropped by more than 5% for the month. So, even some give back in those categories that had been doing pretty well throughout the course of the pandemic. Now, all told, of course, we did have another virus relief package just advanced more stimulus checks and enhanced federal unemployment benefits coming down uh, the pipeline as soon as this month, likely to help retail sales uh, boost going forward. So something to watch here as we continue on into the coming months. Miles and Brian. All right, certainly noisy data ahead, it seems. Emily McCormick, thanks for that update. Let's stay on this morning's retail sales report and bring in Simeon Siegel. He's a managing director over at BMO. Simeon, let's just start with the headline today. Um, you know, you heard Emily kind of go through the different categories, and we know the weather effects. This do anything for you in terms of um, how you are thinking about the prospects for both consumers and, of course, the retailers that you cover? Hey, guys, good to see you. So you said it perfectly, noisy data. Listen, anyone who's buying retail stocks right now is not buying them for January, February, March, April. Right? We're buying them for longer. We're buying them. You're hearing things like roaring 20s. So the demand level and the anticipation of a recovery is much longer than one month, especially to Emily's point, when you know that there's more stimulus coming. So what I would say is I, I think what you want to do is you want to make sure you're not just throwing darts everywhere, unless that's your strategy, but figuring out which are the companies that actually benefited from COVID in various different ways. What are the investment bets that you want to make based on that? And then honestly not being taken by one month here or there, as long as the thesis hasn't changed. And I think what we have seen is definitely not thesis changing. So, I mean, are, are the apparel players, are they the best trade right now on the reopening thesis? And I'll use me as an example. Over the past week, I've thrown out close to 90% of my clothing. I mean, realistically, I, I just, I, seriously, I just don't fit in this stuff anymore. So I've been out there slowly rebuilding my closet. But I, if I'm you know, the, the average or the normal consumer, I imagine uh, a lot of other people are about to do the same thing as well. Um, yeah, listen, without asking which way you don't fit in, I think I think the point is like, listen, you've had this, <laughs> no what, it's, it's, less, <laughs> it's, it's less even the size, it's also the what the design is, it's the notion we haven't gotten out, it's this desire to have newness. I think what's so interesting and we've talked about this on the program before, is for the last 10 years, it's been you spend on experiences, you don't spend on things. And for the better part of the last year, things became the experiences. You had to buy what you wanted to create, the, the fun, the entertainment at home. The notion that you can go out and all of a sudden, how do you look? Are you just wearing sweatpants? As you look in the mirror, th there's that element there, which I think triggers this meaningful wave of apparel spending. And I think what we saw over there, apparel was down less than some of the other items that had been pushing forward. So yeah, I think that makes a world of sense. Listen, the irony is the worst performers last year in theory become the best opportunity this year, but that's not necessarily only the case. There's also companies that managed to do really well over the last period, managed to refashion their businesses and completely change their operating structure by taking advantage of this hopefully once in a lifetime opportunity to, I mean, we've talked about it so many times, sell less, charge more, and you can actually can make more money. So those that took advantage, those that saw this flash in the pan and said, 
we have the opportunity to decide how we want to run our business as opposed to how we've necessarily been running our business, I think can actually come out with sustainable trends moving forward, sustainable success. But yes, Brian, to your point, apparel should have its day in the sun. And, and we haven't been able to say that in a very long time. You know, and Simeon, just in thinking about a couple of the names in your coverage area, and we've got a couple that we're showing the charts of, you know, L Brands, Capri, I mean, Gap, we just talked to uh, their CFO about a week and a half ago. I'm curious as an analyst how you are also thinking about the way that um, market trends, I mean, you know, like my favorite data point is that retail traders are buying low priced per share stocks, not valuation, just cheap stocks because they can buy more of them, right? And that's, you know, a lot of these names are caught up in that kind of bid. I'm curious how you're teasing out that dynamic between the broad market impulse, everything goes up every day, and, you know, the fundamental changes you were just talking about. Yeah, it's fascinating. So, uh, listen, I have to believe that at some point the fundamentals and the reality come back and converge. When that happens, how long that lasts, obviously, is a separate conversation. But generally speaking, I, I have to believe that there is intrinsic value, that something has to be worth something. It can't always be worth more. That doesn't mean rate. That doesn't mean multiples can't change. It doesn't mean how much people want to value an asset doesn't change. But at the end of the day, I look at that model and I have to believe they're going to earn X dollars or generate X percent of cash and go from there. So within that framework, obviously, looking at stocks based on what their stock their literal dollar value on the stock basis, I mean, that, that wouldn't align with intrinsic value. But looking beyond that, I think that the theme that we did see within the trades that you're referring to are people looked at companies that had been left for dead, right? And that idea I fully subscribe to. We've talked about on the show a lot about Victoria's Secret, right? Here you have brand Victoria's Secret and Under Armour, two brands with multi-billion dollars of revenues, very little margin, very little profit, and they were being called dead. You cannot be called dead if you sell $5 billion worth of clothing. But you can be unprofitable. So what happened here was those companies that looking at the platitudes of brands are broken said, well, we can fix ourselves. And they did. And I think that's what's so exciting. And that's why this L brand, LB, which owns Victoria's Secret and Bath and Body Works, has been such a fascinating story to watch because to management's credit, they completely turned around that business and we're able to walk out of this pandemic in a much better state. It's not always the case. That's a hard thing. It's easier, listen, it's easier in my seat to write about than it is to execute. But we've seen a few companies do that. And I think to their credit, I think they've completely changed their history or their future. Yeah, Simeon, I remember you you called that comeback for L Brands on our show. So it's been interesting to follow them. And, and to me, you know, it's really been surprising. Why do you think they've been able to, to turn themselves around? Yeah, so the easiest... And I, and I say this lightly, obviously, the easiest fix is when you have it under your own control. The hardest fix is trying to bring people back into your stores. What Victoria's Secret had to do was actually sell less. They had to, at the risk of um, just, just to kind of be blunt, it, it sounded like they had to fire their customers, fire the dilutive customers, because what had happened over the years in pursuit of growth at all costs everything started promoting. And that's when you watch the profit erode. My general view is revenues are a measure of outside brand buy-in, of customer buy-in. Gross profit is a measure of external brand perception. If you have the former, if you can sell product to people, but they won't pay anything for it, what do you have? So that was that scenario where you're under earning because you're overselling, and that's a much easier problem to fix. And I think that's what they did. As long as they were committed to pulling back inventory, as long as they were willing to acknowledge that revenues were going to go down, but their price points were going to go up. That makes, listen, going back to, to freshman year of college, it's price elasticity of demand. It's an easier thing to say, it's a harder thing to do, and they did it really well. I, I think on the flip side, there are companies that clean their balance sheet. There are companies that look to cut a lot of expenses. There are companies that follow the other side of that Econ 101 that class that we learn. Those classes are buying themselves time. Those, those companies are buying themselves time. Shrinking expenses has never grown a company, whereas raising price has. And as long as this is going to be the really interesting question, this is what you should follow up with me and say, okay, well, who's going to hold that line, right? Because we know traditionally that apparel gives things away. Was this this day of reckoning where everyone changed their view and promotions are somewhat gone, right? And obviously not not universally, but the, to the level we've been we've been trained to expect since two thousand eight. Or do people just say, well, I need to sell an incremental sweater, so here comes the 40 off again. I think we're going to see a divergence of which companies are able to hold the promotional line versus which cross it. And that, I think, is going to be the difference between the winners and the losers for 2021 and beyond. So let, 
Let's uh, let's stay with a company that doesn't love sales, um, and they're a company that was executing uh, at an extremely high level before the pandemic. That's Lulu. Um, interesting chart, interesting setup. You know, you, you kind of get maybe six weeks from now, you're looking at a stock that's actually flat over the last year. Um, I'm curious what you make of of Lulu because again, the story was so compelling. 17, 18, 19. Um, and in a weird way, obviously stock went up a lot with everything else, but now it's at this weird reset point. I'm, I'm curious how you think about this name. Yeah, it's ironic that the winners last year now all of a sudden become less attractive, but but there's an element where that is the case, right? If, if Brian's going out and completely changing his whole wardrobe, but all he bought last year was Lulu, well, then he's changing his wardrobe away from Lulu this year. So I think that there's this interesting dynamic where it's such a phenomenal company and such a strong brand. But at the end of the day, we have to ask, how big does it get? What is the margin structure? What's the cost of doing that when all of these other companies are, again, it's, it's all about fashion and it's figuring out what you want to wear outside. But at the same time, I think we do have to ask the question, and I know we, we, we have fun conversations about this topic, at-home fitness. Is at-home fitness good for an athleisure brand or is it bad for an athleisure brand? Right, A business that built its units based on people going out to very expensive boutique classes multiple times a week, all of a sudden working out became an outfit. If you're working out in your house, you want the best product. You want the thing that looks the best, but do you need eight colors of the same pair of pants? I think that's something we'll have to find out. So I think that the reality here, great company, obviously, phenomenal brand. But yeah, if you think about what have you not bought in the last year that now you're going to want to buy, arguing that that's a pair of leggings becomes a little bit more difficult. I mean, uh, on that point, a conversation between you and I is is not a conversation or a proper one without a chat on Peloton. The stock's down about 27% uh, over the past month. Pretty big sell-off here. Do you think there's another shoe to drop? So I think that also, it's actually it's a great segue for so many reasons. Another great company with great product. But I think that the reality here is we've talked about how big does this business get? And I, I think the I don't know where it is versus Netflix today, but there was a point at which the, Netflix, the Peloton's market cap was somewhere approaching a quarter of Netflix's market cap with less than 1% of its subscriber base. And by the way, that's not knocking Peloton. That's phenomenal. The fact that you're, that you're approaching 1% of Netflix's subscriber base is great, but it also shows where the company lies. And I think ultimately, the interesting thing now is we're seeing more at-home fitness companies come to market. There, there's a greater access for investors. And there's this element where usage and investment can go hand in hand. Up until now, Peloton was the only way to both do at-home exercise, but also to invest in at-home exercise or connected fitness, rather. Both of those two stories are changing. A lot of companies have raised a lot of money over the last six months. And the reality is some of them are even becoming are coming to market. So I think the interesting story here will be Peloton is still a phenomenal, I recommend the bike to anyone who, who wants it. And I joke around to plenty of people who don't, but from a stock perspective, at the end of the day, I think the intrinsic value is lower. And I think that what we're going to find is that five years from now, Peloton and at-home fitness are not going to be synonymous like they are right now. I can't think of a consumer facing product that was the disruptor and is still the dominant force and the only force. At the end of the day, more players enter the market when a market is good enough. And I don't think with a million and a half paying subscribers, a little over a million and a half paying subscribers, that moat is as big as we think it is right now to not allow any other players to emerge. All right. 14% uh, Netflix's market cap is, or sorry, Peloton's 14% the size uh, of, of Netflix on a market cap basis right now. All right, Simeon Siegel, uh, always fun conversation. Really appreciate you taking some time to talk with us this morning. I know we'll be in touch.